Hi, I'm Sheila Kuehl. Welcome to Get Used to It, our show, as you know, on gay and lesbian issues in which uh, members of our community talk to each other about issues of interest to us. Uh, today I have a very special show for you. I've been thinking a long time about this issue of gender and its relationship to the way our community perceives itself and the way the world perceives our community. Uh, now, gender is uh, different from the notion of sex. We know what sex we are. We just check the equipment, right? We're men or we're women. That's about what we have at the moment. But gender is very different. Gender is a kind of an imposition of ways that we are in the world, ways that we think about ourselves. We are female or we are male. At least that's the way they try to define it. And I think the most revolutionary aspect of what our community has brought into this dialogue is we threaten those very rigid notions of gender simply by who and what we are. We know that gender must be very important because it's the only question anyone ever asks when a baby's born. You could probably think of a million things one would want to know about a new life. But no, the only thing we ask is, hey, what'd you have? And the question of gender is so buried in that question, they don't even have to say, did you have a boy or a girl? And everyone knows what we mean. Why is this rigidity of gender differentiation so important that it leads to the, the deepest homophobia and, frankly, some discomfort in our own community when we think about the gender benders with which we ourselves may not be as comfortable? That's the reason for this show today. Three fabulous people to talk to us and share their lives, and not only to describe their lives, but really to talk about kind of what the notion embedded in the way they live their lives is. Uh, my first guest has come all the way from New York to be with us today, uh, Chris Tanner. He is an actor, he is a, an artist, a performance artist, and I'm very pleased to say a drag queen. Yes. A drag queen. <laughs> what a wonderful thing to call oneself. Isn't it a great thing? You do like it, uh, huh, Chris? Yes, I, I love all the connotations. And what are the connotations? Um, well, drag queen. Um, it's kind of like a queen. I don't, I don't really know. It's like dragging something wonderful and royal out of the closet <laughs> and, and bringing it to life. I don't know. It's, like, uh, it's sort of um, tawdry and uh, wonderful. Well, you know, it's, it clearly <laughs> challenges our questions of, of gender. It's really yeah. more than cross-dressing. Although yes. maybe it's cross-dressing carried to its uh, wonderful yes, extreme. It's, yes, it's like I, we were speaking before. Um, like I'm very proud of being a man. I love my genitalia, and I don't want to cover it up or bind it or anything. You know, um, I'm proud of the lump in the skirt, <laughs> and and I don't want to be a woman. I adore women. Women are a huge part of my life, but I want to be a fabulous man. And part you know, of being a fabulous man, I mean, it seems to me drag queens are freer than anyone, despite the fact that they're often painted as kind of very sad or very depressed, uh -huh. or I, I think that's sort of a, a way of putting drag queens down to make everyone think that they're all very suicidal all and depressed. And, and yes. hookers, yeah, which they aren't. So is part of your performance art being a drag queen? Sometimes. A, a lot of it is, yes. Um, it, it's a funny thing. I love myself, being who I am, but when, um, when I was a kid, um, I was uh, in a talent show, and my mother and my grandmother put me in a little slip and pearls, very simple, very elegant. Oh, they did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, there was this great freedom and in, in, in enhancement and attention. And, you know, I hate to say it, I love attention. And, um, <laughs> But also, it, it was, there was a power, something that wasn't there when I'm just being me. Um, and w with that power comes freedom. And, and uh, I, you know, uh, I don't mean to be manipulating or whatever, but there is th this, this sort of freedom, this powerful freedom that, 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 I, that I have when, when I'm in drag. And it's, um, as a painter, I've always been drawn to, to light and color and sequence and festival and, and even even as a kid, you know, um, and uh, you know, fish aquariums and glittering things underwater and, um, 
So my, my painting, I was a neon sculptor for a while. I used to blow neon with a light. Well, then. neon is all about light, too. Yes, right? it is. Yes. See? And Las Vegas and, you know, <laughs> Hollywood <laughs> and everything. Um, but it's, um, then I got into glitter and, and um, into, uh, you know, uh, light surfaces, gold leaf and all that. And, and now, now I just did a show in Paris that was all marabou and feathers and, uh -huh. you know, and glitter and paillettes. And um, it's really, uh, it's me. It's the true essence of me is, is this, is a drag queen. Well, it's, it's also, when you talk about freedom, I mean, I, I understand just from looking at your face mm -hmm. what you mean. It, it is, uh, most of us, I think, when we talk about freedom, mm -hmm. we're talking about a, uh, a sort of a non-boundary kind of existence where we have somehow crossed something mm -hmm. that other people would want us to remain inside. And I often think that that's, with just this aspect of gender roles, mm -hmm. that that's what I see in, in drag queens, that they have crossed something. Is that what you mean by the freedom of it? Yeah, the, yeah. well the freedom to be whatever you are. You're many things. Uh, we, you can be whatever, you can wear a dress and walk down the street, or you can even be walking down the street and see some fabulous woman walk down the street in a great dress, and you can just put that dress on and walk down the street and not even be wearing it. Now, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a free, oh, what were you going to say? Go ahead. Well, I was just, it's interesting because I, I wear pants now all the time, mm -hmm. even on the floor of the state assembly. Isn't that great? And no one thinks twice about it anymore. So people are not freaked out. Now these are not mm -hmm. totally mannish mm -hmm. clothes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are not men's clothes, but mm -hmm. they're certainly men's fashion. Mm -hmm. They are. No one's freaked out about this. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, all women are, it's, it's sort of a, a good thing, you know, for us to wear. Mm -hmm. But uh, whenever I speak to audiences, I say, well, would all the women in the audience who are wearing pants please raise your hand? And you know, a good half of the audience will always raise their hand. Yeah. And then I say, well, all the men in the audience who are wearing dresses, please raise your hand. And everyone laughs. Yeah, they laugh. Yeah. Now, why do you suppose we're so much, we're freaked out by men in dresses, not by women in pants? Well, because men are giving up their, their, uh, you know, their big role, their big suits, you know, their, their testosterone, you know, you know that that's all in the way. And so, um, you know, and they they get freaked out at you for being in a dress, for for a guy being in a dress, but then they want to fuck you, mm. you know, at the same time. You know, which is so weird, like, um, you know, it's taboo, it's all this, you're just messing with their whole psyche, with their whole macho psyche. And um, women are more together, I think, about, about drag queens. I mean, I, I find it. Well, I mean, I'm interested because I, I had heard from some feminists uh, in years mm -hmm. past that they resent drag queens. They think that uh, it's not it has nothing positive to say about women, that it must be done by men who hate women because oh, the, so the, the, it's so exaggerated, uh, so bitchy, so, so many of the negative stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Well, drag queen, it is exaggeration. It's total exaggeration. But let's wallow in it. I mean, it's wonderful. It's, it's, uh, femininity is, is, is wonderful. And it um, it's, has nothing to do with uh, hating women. At least I can speak for myself. I adore women, and I don't want to be a woman, but I love, to, you know, I'm happy with my being a man. But I want to just, you know, wearing a dress doesn't make me a woman. It makes me a queen. It, you know, and it doesn't have anything to do about uh, hating women. I don't understand that. I really don't understand that. Well, I, I feel the same way. I mean, yeah. when you, as soon as you know anyone. You know, I have to interrupt you. Um, a couple women did recently say that to me. I forgot about that. Um, uh, I was, was with my mother and her friend and, and a couple other women. And they said, do you, do you have a problem with women? Do you, do you dislike women? Because so that that so evidently a lot of people do feel that, and that's a real misconception. Um, well, I suppose in the one hand we might mm -hmm. say, well, you know, why is this different from a minstrel show in a way where white people used to wear blackface and do exaggerated sort of blackness? 
Um, but I think it is different because as I hear you talk, it's an aspect of who you of are who inside. That's it's, not, it's like I wanted to play with dress. I remember the first time that I got in trouble for, uh, for playing with a Barbie doll, you know? And um, I got a little taste of that femininity and I wanted to explore it. It has nothing to do with any other women in the whole world except for probably my mother and my grandmother, the people that were right there and Judy Garland on TV when I was very small growing up and getting everything, you know, in my brain. You love Judy Garland oh, too? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you want to sing like her? Oh, to look I, like her? I, yes, I still do. <laughs> yeah, I really understand. I was totally taken with her as a kid. I know. And just wanted to that, be able to, to perform like that, to hit, so to be so open to that yeah. emotion and hit those notes. Yeah. She's, it's, well, I'll tell you what. Yes. Let's take a break. Okay. And if you wouldn't mind, let's see Chris Tanner in drag. All right. All right. Okay. We'll be right back. Well, after a little while. <laughs> It wasn't a big deal, it just seemed like the right thing to do. So it was sort of like the most fitting tribute that, you know, his death, the final comment wasn't his death, it was that, you know, it was life. It was life affirming. Hi, welcome back to Get Used To It. Well, it's only been a few seconds for you, but it's been a little longer for us. And I want to welcome back my guest, Chris Tanner. Hey. Hey, Chris, you look wonderful. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, this is so much fun. I know, isn't it? It really is. You know, this is an interesting time in history because mm -hmm. in the past 12 months, we've seen two major uh, mainstream movies mm -hmm. about drag queens. What's that about? I don't know. It's fabulous. It's, it's really wonderful that, it, you know, middle America is seeing drag in a positive way. Uh -huh. it, it's great. It's wonderful. It's not... Um, I wasn't s totally, f wonderfully pleased about the, the content, though. I thought that they were uh, sort of dickless, and um, I, f I felt that the, the, they sort of, you know, cut the genitalia off the drag queens and made them, you know, it was, it was all homogenized, and, and um, I, I felt kind of bad about that. And they were in drag all the time. All the time. They never, <laughs> they, 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 and if they, you know, when they would have left New Jersey, they would have got the shit beaten out of them, if, you know, if they would have, the, the first gas station they would have pulled into, you yeah. know, and, and drag is wonderful. I, you know, it's so, so wonderful, but it hurts. You know, I've got like a waist cincher on, a girdle, you know, eyelashes in my eyes, a wig on my head, you know, it's, it hurts. You don't want to go, you know, all day long, all night, you know, in drag. So it's a sacrifice really to yeah. be free, I mean, in that yeah, sense, to cross it's those fun. lines. You know, and before again, we were talking about um, women and, and uh, about the, the problems women have, or some women have, you don't have one, mm -hmm. obviously, about men dressing up in drag that it's all stems from love. It's all, it's all about beauty and love and love for glamour and, and for wigs and makeup and, and, and beauty. And it's all from the heart. It's all about love. There's nothing negative about it. It's all about life. But it's sort of like, it, it, doesn't it ratify to some extent this sort of you're either this or you're that? Yes. It's like men can't be glamorous unless they adopt sort of the, the, another culture or this, this culture, yeah. uh, and I don't even mean lifestyle, but I mean how to look glamorous is to look like a woman, uh, in a sense. Doesn't it, 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 it kind of ratifies the fact that you have to choose, doesn't it? Well, um, it's always been, look at, look, well, look at peacocks. I mean, you know, they're big, fa they're men, they're big, fabulous, but they've got all the feathers and, and everything, and Louis the Fourteenth, and you know, and all, and like great princes and everything, but you know, it, I don't want to make it so, I mean, women have the best dresses, I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, the, um, it's, uh, uh, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's prettier, it's, it's more beautiful, it's much more fun to, you know, be dressed like this than a truck driver or well, a I think it's, suit. Well, I think it's incredibly revolutionary, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think it's any mistake that drag queens were deeply involved in the Stonewall riots. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were talking about Judy Garland earlier. Yes, we were. And there is this mythology, and I don't know whether it's true, that part of what really happened that day uh, had to do with Judy Garland, at yeah, least for drag died. queens. She died that day. Yes. Yeah. Do you think and that's so true? People, I think so. I think so with all my heart. I don't know the, um, the, the correct history of it, but I believe it because um, it, for something 
with gay people. What is it about Judy Garland? You tell it's, me. It's the, I think it's, you know, it's that, that incredible voice and, 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 you know, the heart on the sleeve and, and the voice and that, and that naked, raw, beautiful f feeling in front of the camera that she had, you know, um, that we can relate to and that, and also, uh, yeah, about drag, so, sure, of course, uh, like a lot of guys, you know, drag queens, um, you know, even me, sometimes I'm a little, I feel like myself sometimes, you know, and with people and at parties or if I'm alone, especially if I'm alone in a gay bar, you know, or alone in some weird, like I was in Paris and I had all my paintings with me and I was, uh, and I went to the gay center in Paris because right next to my gallery and I was really pissed off because my gallery wasn't open and here I had all my paintings with me from New York City and I was like saying, oh, hi, I'm from New York, and they go, oh, ha, ha, so it's just a fully, fully, coolly, pala, dooly, dooly. I can't speak French. <laughs> and so then, um, you know, and then I'm sitting around, and I'm trying to, and I thought, it's a, you know, oh, so how are you? Uh, fine, you know. And I felt like really, you know, I started to sweat, and I was alone, and I, I thought, oh, God, did any of these guys think I'm cute, or do they think I'm a nerd? Or, <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh -huh. but, but when when you put on a dress and everything, and you're performing, and like maybe like Judy Garland or something, then you have all this confidence in you, and you have another being, and you're wearing this fabulous wig, and aren't you beautiful? And you can tell because you walk down the street, and everybody looks at you, and you, it's all this power. Well, I see it as a kind of an extension, as as kind of carrying it beyond where most people would have the courage to go, where you know that you feel more confident when you're dressed the way that you, you look in the mirror the and you say, you I look great. I look fabulous, I look great a lot of ways. You're many things, you were an actress and now you're a, a great assemblywoman. And, and, and look at Leonardo da Vinci, he was a, a painter, but um, he made airplanes. You know, you can do many things. Why not do everything and do it fabulously? If I wanna wear a dress today, I can just get up and wear a beautiful dress or I can, you know, go, you know, wear a big leather jacket and, you know, be tough. But you know, Chris, what you said about getting beat up, I mean, it was a little bit of a joke about New Jersey in a way, but still, yeah. it is true. It's a dangerous thing to cross these lines. I mean, even the gay and lesbian community, oh, yeah. I'm sure you've found, oh, a lot of is freaked out, angry. They don't want drag queens in the parades. Everyone will think badly of us. Yeah. As though we're not enough of an extreme, you know, we'll say, well, I'm healthy, but, but what they're... Is, what is that about? Well, I guess it's but, a way of even our community saying, uh, you know, I'm better together. than you. Yeah, and, and, and what is that? And, and also the women, they're always telling the women to take, put their shirts back on. They don't want, you know, it pisses me off. <laughs> It's true. It's really about yeah. freedom, isn't it? Yeah, it's about freedom. Isn't it funny that a want? country that talks nonstop about freedom is most freaked out when people really exhibit it? I know. And just about wearing a, a wig and a dress. Yes, I know. Now, like what that's, is that about? Yeah. That's why talking about gender, I think, today um, is uh, sort of the essence of what, what I want to get at. Because mm. you, you look wonderful. Okay. And you know that you look wonderful and you feel good. And your paintings have to do with drag as well, yeah, they right? They do. They do all about light and life and and vibrancy and fantasy and and sex and 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 um, and love and beauty. Now, do you, do you find that <laughs> all so are all drag queens gay? <laughs> yes, I think all drag queens are gay, and I, I'm proud of that. If, uh, transvestites are kind of is like a weird word to me. It feels like. It feels like now be careful who you put down, okay? <laughs> no. Excuse me, darling. Really, I don't, I don't want to put anybody down. No, but I always think of straight men with sweaters. I love Ed Wood. You know, Ed Wood was a great filmmaker, Glenn uh -huh. and Glenda, uh -huh. you know, and they uh -huh. just did that great movie. Yes, um, which I loved. Everybody involved with, but um, you know, I was thinking, don't you think of st straight men? You know, with their wife's cashmere sweaters <laughs> thrown in the closet. You know, I think drag queens are gay men. I'm a I'm a fruit in a dress. You know, I'm a fruit in a dress, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a drag queen. I love that name, the drag queen. Love it is. It. You wouldn't want to use any... Uh, illusion paler, performer. Sort of, yeah, was right. that what you... What were you going to say? I don't know. It's some uh, kind of paler word, I Yeah, was like say. drag illusionist or some kind of word they use. No, now, I love when drag you, queen. Now, when you perform, yes. do, do you sing? Do you... Oh, um, I, s I have a wonderful voice. I sing and... Uh, <laughs> I sing and dance with my all my body parts and everything. Yeah, it's my voice. Yeah, when I sing, and when I and I do sh uh, plays and things. And so, do you appear all over the world, or mostly in um, New York? In or? New York, um, can I tell you? I'll, yes, I'll tell you. please. Um, um, in the thirtieth of November, I open in, at La Mama in Polly's Panic Attack. 
It's a Christmas nightmare. It's the horror in the holly, the terror in the tinsel. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm really gonna get killed for this one. I, at the kitchen, I'm doing a one-man art show of my paintings, but I'm doing, you know, remember, um, well, I'm doing Lana Tanner in Imitation of Imitation of Life, oh, the musical. Good. Oh, that's good. And so good. people, you know, in the gay community, they, they, they're killing me now also because of the black and white thing. Uh -huh. You know, whenever you do uh -huh. a little something, but I don't care, I'm doing it. I really believe in it, and I believe racism is a hideous monster, and I want to put it in people's face. Chris, it's been wonderful talking to you. I've had uh, such a good time. I, I really time. appreciate it. You came all the way out to L.A., really, to do the show. Well, I think you're and, fabulous. Well, I think you're fabulous. Well, <laughs> I've had a great time. Okay. Stick around, we've got even more. Billy wants to work on airplanes someday. Maybe one that you fly in. Now, would you like to call for this free booklet of simple ways to improve his education? Hi, welcome back to Get Used To It. Uh, as you know, today we're exploring issues around really gender bending. Uh, roles, uh, various ways in which our community is having to face uh, its own approval and disapproval uh, concerns. And our next guest today is Anhe Kang, who's one of the founders and co-chair of the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Sisters. Uh, she has done extensive work in our community around issues of racism, people of color uh, in our mm -hmm. community, but also specifically around issues of bisexuality in the, uh, her own organization right. and really I think in the broader community. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Well thank you, I'm glad to be here as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, a little difficult these days being a bisexual activist in our community, isn't it? Actually I think it's a very exciting time because it seems like the bisexual community is really mobilizing at this time and doing a lot of educational work. Um, so I think it's a good time to be at because um, I definitely feel that bi bisexuals are also part of the queer community, which represents the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgenders. Well, but it's, it's interesting. I would assume that the kind of, I, I don't know if we'd go so far as to say disapproval, mm -hmm. but let, let me use the word discomfort. Mm -hmm. Straight community is uncomfortable with bisexuals right. for one reason, right. I would assume. Mm -hmm. Our community is also sort of right. having issues around it. Could you explore that a little bit for me? I think that for both the straight community and the gay and lesbian community, it's, it's a, that bisexuality is very difficult to conceptualize, I guess, because we've always been told you have to be one or the other. You can either be straight or you can be gay and lesbian. And here we are as bisexuals saying, no, we have the capability, capability to be emotionally and physically attracted to both men and women. It sort of is a challenge to our community, of course our community is in complete denial mm -hmm. that this is what we're doing, but mm -hmm. we sort of replicate mm -hmm. the heterosexual either or mm -hmm. notion ourselves. Right. Because they're the ones that said you're either straight or you're gay. Right. And we're saying that we can, we, we're not straight or we're not, um, we're not gay, but we're basically saying that we have the capability and we are also part of the queer community because we are still facing the same kind of discrimination based on your sexual orientation which gays and lesbians face. And this is something though that we do have to also face in the heterosexual community as well as with some gays and lesbians because they don't understand that we're not talking about straight privilege as some of them think that we are doing, but we're talking about we face discrimination based on our sexuality because we are basically attracted to both men and women. This was an aspect of the, your founding of uh, LA Asian Pacific Sisters too because I, I, I know you were saying mm -hmm. to me that often women will come to the organization but they're really not sure that they're lesbian or okay. ready to, you know, say I'm lesbian. Right. Um, basically the LA Asian Pacific Islander Sisters is open to both lesbians and bisexual women as well as women who are questioning their sexual identity because we don't want to say that, no, you're definitely a lesbian, you're definitely a bisexual. We're, we want women to find out for themselves in an environment where they feel comfortable to come out. We actually have a mentor program for women who are questioning their sexual identity and we um, basically set them up either with the bisexual or lesbian women depending upon what, you know, what they think that they're more comfortable with and have basically provide support for them so that they can talk to somebody about their sexual identity and we're saying you don't have to choose, it's okay if you don't choose, that's alright. 
Well, I know that a number of lesbian activists that mm -hmm. I've known in my life are very um, impatient mm -hmm. with uh, women who think they're bisexual because very much like straight parents say to their gay children, this is only a phase, you'll get over it. Lesbian, and I assume gay men too, say to bisexuals, this is only a phase, you're in total denial about your gayness, right. you'll get over it and you should be brave right. and, you know, and declare that you're gay. But this is entirely different no, from what you think is the truth. And I guess I say it is not a phase. I a face. I think it's pr it's pretty brave of me to be coming out as a bisexual to gays and lesbians because I know that there is a lot of discriminations against bisexuals and I say that when I first came out actually I did come out as a bisexual but however due to my lesbian friends who kept on insisting and hey you're afraid you're afraid to admit that you're a lesbian I finally said okay that's fine I'll come out as a, as a lesbian because I guess you're right maybe I am afraid um, but the thing was, I never felt comfortable with that identity. I just felt that it wasn't me. And it wasn't until I met other bisexual women who were willing to say, I am bisexual and I'm proud of it, that I felt comfortable to say, okay, uh, you know, I, I'm going to start coming out as a bisexual. And it was a process for me to come out because so many of my friends knew me as a lesbian and were unwilling to accept my bisexuality. And there were some pretty heated arguments sometimes based on my sexual orientation when I felt that they should be accepting of it and be happy for me that I finally know who I am. But it is difficult. And you're in a relationship at the, at, the, at this time, right? Right. I, I shouldn't am, say at the moment, it's been a long-term relationship. It's, 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 it's two and a half year. We've been together two and a half years. It is with the woman who identify as a lesbian. She does not have a problem with my uh, I guess identifying as a bisexual. Um, she feels that it's not how you identify with, but more of whether we have a common bond and whether we understand each other and can trust. So it's, it's a very good relationship that I have. I suppose everyone in a relationship is always worried about the other person, you know, having affairs or whatever. Right. But I guess part of believing that you will stay in a lesbian mm -hmm. relationship might relate to whether you were sure that you know you really wanted to be there in terms of your sexuality but maybe that's not the case i i think a lot of people believe that if a, if they are dating a bisexual i mean for example if um i've been with other women who said you're definitely going to leave me for a man mm -hmm. and i said that's not what i mean when i'm saying i'm bisexual it means that i have the capability to be attracted to to both men and women but it doesn't necessarily mean that i'm going to leave you for a man or that i'm going to be dating both men and women at the same time because i definitely believe in monogamous relationships and i think that it's important to have a monogamous relationship if you plan on growing so well it's i, I guess in a way it, it's a very important step for our movement to take to mm -hmm. embrace bisexuality mm -hmm. because it it allows us to move forward on a path that says there are a lot of different ways to be we don't need to adopt that mm -hmm. kind of hierarchical duality stuff right. that they insist on right we don't need to adopt it either right exactly you know we need to allow people to to grow in their own way and identify whomever they are right I agree because I think it's we it's a very wide spectrum and I think it is important because we're all basically facing discrimination based on our sexuality. That's what we're all facing, as well as the fact that I feel that I belong in the community because I, I do love women and I do care about women, so that's another aspect of it. So I think it is definitely important to open it up and we can all definitely join together in educating, basically, I guess, the straight community about who we are. And how do you think the, the, the women in the uh, LA Asian Pacific Islander sisters um, are themselves embracing this notion. I know that in the beginning we had some lesbians who were very uncomfortable with having bisexual women and we've actually done two sensitivity workshops to educate everyone and just have it straight that um, we are accepting of both lesbians and bisexual women and we wanted this especially for bisexual women to know that they don't have to face actually discrimination by lesbian women because it has happened where um, some of the bisexual women were verbally abused by some of the lesbians and we didn't as, as, as the board we felt that that wasn't right it's really important that they understand that we're all part of the organization and since then we really haven't had a problem and we've actually had more bisexual women who come out and admit that they're bisexual and feel comfortable admitting it 
episode? Well, you know, there are a number of women in the community who are, uh, I guess I would call it serially bisexual. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what, you, if you're in monogamous relationships, you would almost have to be, right? Right. Um, but I mean, a number of us, I'll speak from my own experience, mm -hmm. when I was in a relationship with a woman for the first 12 years of my sort of adult life. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know whether that was enough to make me a lesbian. I know that's a sort of a joke now, mm -hmm. but I just didn't know. I had fallen in love. We were in this monogamous relationship, and I didn't know. So I wanted to explore my sexuality with men, which mm -hmm. I did for several years mm -hmm. in my 30s. Mm -hmm. And I think that it actually sort of broadens the way that you can understand everyone's sexuality. Right. Because it was a, it was a wonderful experience. I. I simply discovered that I, n I didn't fall in love mm -hmm. with a man, that my mm -hmm. own affectional preference, mm -hmm. right. you know, was women. Right. But I, I think that it's very important for people to understand that if we allow these barriers to be broken down in our own mm -hmm. community, in our mm -hmm. own selves, that we're moving the revolution along a little bit for everybody. Right. I definitely agree with what you said because I think it's very important to explore and to let other people explore. I think you should never pigeonhole a person into saying you're this or that because I think everyone should make up their own mind or decide what they are. And if they decide like 10 years later or 5 years later that that's not who they are, I think that's okay too because people go through transitions, they change as they grow. And I think it's basically alright as long as we know within ourselves who we are. I think that's the most important thing. Now, if people watching the show are saying, gosh, I never heard anybody say anything that made so much sense to me, and mm -hmm. I, I think I really am a bisexual, I'm getting pressure from both communities, where would you suggest they, they go to connect and, and get a little validation? I know that there are definitely bisexual um, organizations. There's the Bisexual Network, I believe. Um, I know that they could also probably call the Gay and Lesbian Center to find out about bisexual support group. I think that's a good way to start. Most of the centers in most of the cities right, have now right. incorporated this because I know we, we've incorporated bisexual into the name of our movement. And right. I, as I said, I think that's a really important. Right, and I think that it, it is pretty easy to find a referral if, you, if you're looking for it. And I guess basically go to your, your gay and lesbian center and ask them about it. So do you think this work is basically political too? Um, in terms of um, coming out as bisexual, or yeah. what do you mean? Well, I mean, we, we found that our own sexuality, mm -hmm. which seemed very personal in, in the old days when it was very secret, mm -hmm. is really a political sort mm -hmm. of thing. Not right. only a way of organizing, but almost a statement mm -hmm. of anti-institutionalism. Mm -hmm. You know, we are who we are, and, and in being that, we're challenging all mm -hmm. of the status quo, and in a way, I guess, challenging right. the right wing. No, I, I agree in that sense that it is political. We're definitely saying um, it's a coming out process. It's, it's, it's basically saying I, I shouldn't have to hide myself or closet myself in the gay and lesbian community or in the straight community when I am bisexual. It's, it's definitely political as well as in the civil rights saying that you cannot discriminate against me because of my sexual identity. Um, you just cannot do that. So definitely it is political. Uh, it seems to me that the sort of the next generation, the people in their 20s, mm -hmm. are more comfortable right. and almost insistent on mm -hmm. this uh, idea that bisexuality is, is the natural, mm -hmm. or at least a very natural mm -hmm. way to be. Um, I know that uh, even women who identify very strongly mm -hmm. as lesbians mm -hmm. are um, wanting to explore their sexuality with, you know, with mm -hmm. men that they love mm -hmm. in the gay community. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you see it more among young people who seem less, less rigid about these things? You know, I, I think I do see that. Just like I've, I've noticed, for, as an example, um, I met Asian lesbians in their 40s and 50s who had a very difficult coming out or even forming an organization saying, we're out. Uh, as well as whereas with Lapis, we're definitely out and we're visible. And I think definitely for the younger generation, it, it's a lot easier for them to be out and be more open about it and explore their sexuality, which I think is wonderful, because I think they should do that. I don't think that they should be afraid to, um, to, to basically, ex I guess, explore. But how about the guys? Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks to me like many of the bisexual activists are women. Mm -hmm. Are men involved in the bisexual movement as well? There are definitely men involved. I think there, I mean, there's definitely both bisexual men and women. Sure. So, so yes, 
they are definitely uh, more involved, but I guess it's just that I've been part of the women's movement more often, so I'm not as well, inf as well informed, but yes, that there are definitely men who are involved. Because it seemed to me that sometimes men have more, gay men have more of a concern mm -hmm. about this bisexuality and understanding it. Mm -hmm. than some of our lesbian women, but I could be wrong. Really, I've always thought it was the other way around, because, you know, I've actually <laughs> always had gay male friends who tell me, I don't understand why the women are making such a fuss about your bisexuality, <laughs> so I don't know. Well, I really appreciate you being with us today. And Thank you. Um, keep up the good work, and we'll be back in exactly 11 seconds. Trust us. Having sex without using a condom is like playing a game of Russian roulette. For more information, call Planned Parenthood. Hi, welcome back to Get Used to It. Our final guest today is Connie Norman, who is known to many of us here in Southern California. She has a cable show. She writes for Update. Uh, she is an AIDS activist. And for the purposes of this show, as well as uh, our friendship, um, Connie is here because she's a member of our transgendered community and has been, well, she'll tell you, either since the moment she was born or since the surgery in 1976. But in the further exploration of our issue today in terms of this issue of gender bending in our community, who better to talk to us than Connie Norman? Connie, Great. welcome. Glad to be here, darling. Always happy to have the opportunity to talk about how we transgender folk fit into the community and, and our place in the schism of things. Well, the schism of things is an interesting way to put it because it, in this issue where gay and lesbian people are saying, look, you know, we're just a regular part of the natural progression of things. Uh, you should just accept us. It's not about, you know, being a man or a woman or whatever. It's about sexual orientation. But in terms of the transgendered community, it really is about being a man or a woman. What, tell me what this means to you. Yeah, for many trans sexual slash transgender folk, it is about being a man or a woman. For some transgender folk, it's just finding your human spirit and, and finding what expression that human spirit is going to take. We deal in gender in Western patriarchal society in absolutes. And sorry, men, but there's no such thing as absolutes when it comes to gender. It's a spectrum and, and a bell curve. And male males being over here and female females being over here. And the vast majority of folk fall somewhere in between. Transgender folk tend to fall toward the top of the bell curve and either lean toward masculine or feminine. I took a more feminine path in my journey in life, but I've certainly been with and understood transgender folk who took a more masculine path, my husband. Mm -hmm. The man, the gay man that I married is just as transgender as they come. I know a lot of lesbian sisters who don't think of themselves as transgender, but in fact they are expressing transgenderism. I think that our definition of transsexualism is founded on a heterosexist male patriarchy way of thinking. This sort of either or. Oh, that's this, right. This absolute duality without right. anything in between. I was never offered the option of transgenderism because, of course, it didn't exist mm -hmm. when I was going through my changes. Mm -hmm. And so you had to become a sex change if you were going to be like a woman. Mm -hmm. That's the way it worked. That's what all the doctors said. And the doctors insisted that not only do you become a woman, but you become like a Stepford wife kind of woman. Mm -hmm. I think it's been very harmful to a whole generation of transgender folk. Now, we tell, need tell to us, I'm tell sorry. our children, our transgender children, that it's okay to be exactly who you are. Now, when you use the term transgender, you don't mean uh, surgically changed, as we would say, right? Well, that's right although it can be, right. I, living proof, right. <laughs> I consider myself transgendered slash transsexual, but I certainly have a larger affinity for transgenderism than I do transsexualism. Transgenderism is a relatively new term that the community coined itself so that we could begin to more express the spectrum 
of who we are mm -hmm. instead of the absolutes. Here in this America, we love to pigeonhole and everybody all be alike and all be the same together. And that's not the way it works. And it's a great lie when we try to make it work. What was it like you, uh, for you as, uh, as earlier in your life? I mean, how did you come to the realization that you, given only the choices that you had at the time, that you really did not want to be of the male sex? I mean, gender is much more sort of how we, uh, you know, our, our, our mannerisms and the way we are in society. Sex is really much more a matter of the equipment, don't you think? Well, first of all, I have to give thanks to my other spirit. I really do believe that we're two spirit folks and that other spirit has been with me all my life and who that other spirit is is that little transgender child that remained true to itself and remained true to itself in here. It was my quiet, still voice that would never let me be anything but myself and I'm very grateful for that. Now, as far as making the surgical decision, I looked at my life. I had been a runaway street kid and gotten on drugs and I went home to clean up and all that and I looked at where I wanted my life to go, what direction. And I looked at how we treated drag queens. We only let them be whores or clowns and I didn't like that. I, I, I had a little, not saying that drag queens don't have dignity because they certainly do, but for me I couldn't see a lifetime of being a whore or a clown. I abhorred getting on stage. <laughs> and doing drag shows. Uh, I thought lip syncing was just untalented. <laughs> I've since changed my mind, of course. And so I looked at that and I didn't like the way society looked at or treated drag queens. Uh, I looked at Nelly Gay Men, which is the essence of who I am. And I certainly didn't like not only how society, but how our own youth-obsessed culture in the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community, how they treated Nellie gay men. And I said, there's no dignity in either of those paths. Mm. If I get a sex change, by the time I'm 35 or 40, I'll be acclimated to my role, and society will leave me alone to be as Nellie as I want. This castration compromise, you know, has been going on in Western culture far longer than we realize. Right. Uh, Christine Jorgensen wasn't the first. Mm -hmm. The Hijras of India have been castrating themselves for 400 years in order to be just that, not man, not woman, Nelly. Mm -hmm. uh, I celebrate my Nelliness, but I had to walk the path that I walked to come to the point that I did. When the gay boys said I didn't belong, I'd snap those fingers and say, prove it, honey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because you, you, I got a sex change, not a lobotomy, and you'll never cut the queen out of my head. The, 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 the queen has been aligned with that little transgender spirit in me all my life, and I'm so grateful for it. Well, it, it's, it's interesting to me how the community has, uh, much of the community still has a discomfort with transgendered people, though I give us great credit that in naming our community now and through the work of people, I think, you know, I, I don't think, I know, like you, I who have did my said, part. who have insisted that we ourselves come to grip with our own, uh, you know, sort of strange feelings about gender and gender bending, where we say, well, I'm okay, but the next group is, you know, has gone too far. And then the next group says, well, no, 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 we're fine, but the next group has gone too but far. But you know, we've been doing that generationally all of my life. When the gender benders came along, the cockettes and that movement that came out of San Francisco, they really thought they were the first, but they were not. In my lifetime, there was also the era of the hair fairy, where you'd from here up be full woman, from here down be in some outrageously Nelly men's clothing because drag was illegal. Uh, among our Native American brothers in many indigenous cultures, we had folk that wore pants and skirt so that they could make the statement of not man, not woman. We have, as we've assimilated uh, and drawn in the indigenous cultures that we conquered, we didn't assimilate some of their traditions. No, as a matter of fact, which, we wanted to stamp it out. Oh, that's I right. Mean, in many ways. But there are traditions that had been here for tens of thousands of years, and it was a way of folk living together. 
The children were not raised as male or female. The children were raised as children. Mm -hmm. And they decided male or female when puberty came. It was the children that made the decision. Now it seems as though, and, and this is something with which I've also agreed for a long time, that the natural order of things is much more of a spectrum, as you oh, said. Oh, that's right. And that it's a spectrum along various expressions of what we call gender. But we can see how rigidly the society insists on this either or. Mm -hmm. Why do you think there's such insistence on this Honey, duality? Fear or love. There's only two emotions that exist in the planet. It's fear or love. Love is the absence of fear. Fear is the absence of love. And you either fear something or you love something. And usually we're feared because we tell men, eh, go put on a dress, you'll feel better. <laughs> you know, we tell folks to not take themselves so seriously about their gender roles, and that's frightening to people. But there must also be some power stuff in it because, you know, I, when I speak to an audience, I say, all the women in the audience who are wearing pants, raise your hands. And, you know, good half of the audience always raises their hands now. And I say, and will all the men in the audience wearing dresses please raise your hands? And everyone laughs because it's unthinkable in general society. We make it much easier for the female to take on male aspects and characteristics rather than the opposite. We make it very difficult for the male to take on feminine characteristics. And why do you think we make it so difficult? <laughs> Fear and love, honey. Fear and love. There's only two fear and love. It's because we're afraid of it. Because I say to the heterosexual man with my being that we're just alike, you and me. Because I don't, I, I've come to a point in gender, I don't even really see gender. I see the human that they're projecting at me. Now that human may have flavors of male or female, but I really see the human and it does give you a lot of power. It really does. Because you see beyond our societal trappings into the soul and the heart of a person. It's great power. It truly is. And really, it's nothing I can turn on or off. It's become a part of my being. I think it becomes a part of most transgender folks' beings because we spend so much time observing the others. Mm -hmm. We are the one among the many all of our lives. And we work so hard to figure out ourselves, not many of us around us when we're kids, that we start observing other folk. So observing and understanding other folk then becomes second nature to us. It's quite a gift. Now, are you, when, if young people say to you, I have the same feelings that you did, I feel that there's this spirit inside me and I'm not, I, I don't feel as though I'm fully who I want to be. I mean, use, use the term to me, you were given permission mm -hmm. to be the Nellie that you were. Mm -hmm. And the permission is, now people say, oh, well, she's a woman, so it's really okay for her to act this way but because in, she's a woman. But in fact, I'm not a woman. Mm -hmm. In fact, I am a not man, not woman. Mm -hmm. In fact, I am something other than male or female. Now, I don't think we've defined that yet, and I hope we never do, but I'm very proud to emulate and walk the path of life together with my female sisters. Uh, they have kinder hearts, and I think that's what appealed to me mostly. Um, uh, Would you tell, t if young people, though, come and ask you, is this something yourself, that I should yourself, do? Be yourself, be yourself be yourself. Don't let them doctors tell you how to live. If, if you think it's okay for you to be a guy that puts on dresses or a male that takes on feminine characteristics, you don't have to cut your penis off in order to achieve that comfortability. Seek and find that comfortability in yourself and then they don't matter. And if you go inside and you find that what you want is more of the woman path, then take it. But don't take it because somebody tells you to. Take it because it's your path. And that's what I tell my little tranny children. Connie, it's complicated too in your life at the moment uh, um, by, uh, because you're also a person with AIDS. Oh, raging with AIDS, my dear. The body is absolutely failing. The spirit is soaring. Well, anyone can see that. Yeah. The Anyone spirit can is see absolutely that. soaring, and I've been given many gifts, 
from this blessing curse of AIDS. I know a lot of folk don't like to think of AIDS as a gift, but I've had many lessons put before me that I got to learn easily because my life was accelerated. So for me, it's a blessing curse. And how have other people in the, in the AIDS community um, accepted you, dealt with you? I mean, you're a wonderful activist, well, absolutely you know, fabulous and on the line every minute. I have to say that I've been very well accepted. Of course, I was not just there to say, transgender, trans, I was there to do the work. And, and I participated in the tables I sat at. I didn't just sit there to be a label. I participated in the work. I, uh, when they said organize, I organized everybody. You know, so you have to be willing to participate in the work in order to gain acceptance. The PC code is not enough anymore. Right. We need real human beings doing real work. And I did that with AIDS and continue to do it today. I believe that it, it is and continues to be genocide. I think Bill Clinton's just about a half inch better than Ronald Reagan. And so the work is before us. And, you know, I let the work be my reward, not the reward. Many folk get in the AIDS industry, they focus on that paycheck. Mm -hmm. If you'll just focus on the work, the paycheck will come. You, you know, whatever you need to be supported in the work, if it's truly the work of, of taking care of the needs of folks with HIV and AIDS and, and getting for them the comfort and compassion that we need as human beings, we all need to have that compassion. If AIDS hasn't taught us anything, it's taught us the lesson of compassion. And it's taught that lesson to folks who are compassionless. So it's been a great teacher on the land, and I'm, I'm, like I say, it's a blessing curse. I'm grateful for the blessings, and I'm a little angry that I won't get to be an old lady, because I wanted so much to be an old lady, and, you know, talk to the young kids like an old codger, but... I know, it's funny the way life leads us sometimes, isn't it? Oh, that's right. And you really don't know. We sort of make the best of whatever it is, although... Some of us do. Yeah. Some of us prattle and whine. <laughs> <laughs> and make the best, and prattle, and wine. Oh, that's right. We have many gifts in our humanity. You know, I'm curious about your husband, speaking of gifts, mm -hmm. um, because you mentioned him mm -hmm. and uh, said, you know, as a gay man who's your husband, and I'm sure that people are saying, wow, now there's a whole lot of different sort of gender issues and relationship issues and coming to grips with issues. Well, um, we have an open relationship. I encouraged him to be the gay man that he was because he's a major bottom, I'm a major bottom, don't work <laughs> right. <laughs> but we loved each other and respected each other for who we were as human beings. And as Bruce and I, that's my husband, my boo bear, as we've been together for these coming up 13 years, I gave him that permission that society never would give me to be just as nelly a gay man as you want to be. And he has grown, just grown in his nelliness, and is so happy and secure. So it's been a delight to give my gift of self-acceptance to him. Well, it just completely explodes the mythology of duality, doesn't it? Because you are, you are a lesbian and a gay man and a heterosexual I've all at the all same time. <laughs> I've been all those things. All at the same time. I can't even really figure out. I pretty much got my gender down. I'm not man, not woman. But I couldn't tell you what my sexual orientation is because I've enjoyed human beings in their expressions of sexuality from all walks of life. Straight women, straight men, gay women, gay men. <laughs> so if you had a lesson that you wanted to give or just a piece of advice that you wanted to give to the probably thousands of people watching this at the moment, what would you say to them? Absolutely, unequivocally, let no one allow you not to be yourself. Be yourself. It's the most important lesson we can learn. It's the most important thing we can do. And we all know who our self is if we'll listen to the quiet, still voice inside. Not that committee up in your head, because they make a lot of noise. But all of us, I think, have that quiet, still, spiritual voice that tells us how to be ourselves. 
And I ask folks to just listen to that. And, and you have to practice and become studied at it before you can hear the voice, because we try to discount it. And, you know, nah, nothing like that exists. But it does exist, and it exists in all of us. And it'll guide us through every path we need to take. Connie, thank you so very much. Thank you all for being with us. Um, hope you enjoyed the show. Hope you'll uh, stay with us through the rest of the year. And remember, whatever it is we ask you to do, get used to it. There are boys already for kissing. And I mean to kiss me up for you. Well, those guys don't know what they're missing. I've got a lot of living. And the steaks, yeah, all ready for tasting. And those Cadillacs, all shiny and new, gotta move. Cause time is wasting, I've got a lot of living to do. Oh, well, there's music to hear, places to go, people to see. Everything for you and me. Life's the ball, if only I know it. It's all just waiting for you. You're alive, so come on and show it. There's such a lot of living, such a lot of living, such a lot of living, living, living.